Hello, thank you for listening to the Next Gen Planners podcast. Just a note to add before this episode to give you some extra context. This episode of the podcast was recorded as part of our massive CPD light year in a day event. This was where Next Gen Planners ran 11 streams of content for seven hours in each stream. Uh, We had a whole host of fabulous guests and we can't wait for you to hear these brilliant conversations. Enjoy. Welcome to the Next Gen Planners podcast. Next Gen Planners is a financial planning community with a supportive membership that strives for inclusion and best practice throughout our profession and the industry. This podcast is designed to support your always learning mentality by gathering insights from inside and outside of financial services. So sit back and enjoy. Welcome to this very special episode of the Next Gen Planners podcast. My name is Dan and I'm the head of marketing here at Next Gen Planners. And for this special episode as part of your CPD light year in a day from Next Gen Planners, I am delighted to be joined. Uh, it's nine o'clock in the morning for this person as well. So please, please give us some sympathy of having to do this at nine o'clock in the morning with me uh, by Diana Kabi says, how are you doing today, Diana? Hi, Dan. I'm doing fabulous. Thank you for asking. And thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to share some of my knowledge with the audience today. And I'm so glad that we connected those few months ago when we did. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, it really is. I and mean, like I said, we've we've been connected now for a couple of months and we've only now just got you around to having you on the podcast. So massively appreciate it. I know how busy you are and I know how much you're doing. So this really, really is uh, an honor to have you on. So thank you so much for coming on today, Diana. So for anybody in the audience who doesn't know who Diana is, first of all, what are you doing? Uh, but second of all, she is a, a marketing specialist and chief brand evangelist, which is something that I'm going to be honest, not many people in the UK are likely to know what that actually means, Diana. But today we'll talk a bit about that and what it actually means. And she works with uh, financial technology companies in the US. So we do this with everyone, Diana. Kick us off a little bit. Tell us what you get up to on a daily basis and the kind of things that you do for those financial technology companies as well. Yeah, absolutely. So chief brand evangelist, uh, another way of thinking about this term is an ambassador. And when you think about ambassadorship, it's very much involving amplifying the voice of whatever companies that I'm working with. So on a daily basis, I'm hosting webinars. I am interviewing customers. There's lots of video production. And the purpose is not just to amplify the product that they're selling, Dan, but also the problem that they're solving, right? Getting down to the root and and really the bigger picture, if you will, around what are they solving in the industry? How are they helping financial planners be better, grow more, be more productive. And I've noticed over the years, there's a lot of great tech companies in this space and it's continuing to grow, but not every tech company knows how to vocalize what they're good at. And and so you look to someone like myself, that's just my talent. That's my special sauce. And I'm also passionate about technology. So it, it really fits together. I launched back in January and it's been pretty successful. And I, I think a lot of planners in the space, they know they need technology, but they just, they want to skip the sales fluff and they want to get right down to the point of how is this going to help me grow? And that's what I'm helping companies do. That's amazing. It is, and it's been lovely to watch you grow as well. Cause I actually remember seeing you talking about this at the start of the year. It's weird how we've now got connected networks and even though there's Uh a massive ocean between us and all that kind of, but I can remember looking, I didn't really know who you were at that point, Diane, I'm going to be completely Mm -hmm. honest. And, you know, it was just great to see since then, you mentioned how busy it is now and how popular it is. I mean, you've got some, some, pretty big clients now if we're going to be honest like get into the middle of the year and it's been fantastic to see because if we like again let's just be transparent about this this chief brand evangelist thing is not a common thing to have heard it's just quite a new thing and to have made it work as much as you have already you know after a while that five months of of, of it being there is yeah. really really nice to see um so yeah fantastic work so yeah. what we're going to do today is we're going to be chatting about that the brand the, the ambassador part of of everything with this mm-hmm. and also how that can impact 
So how having brand ambassadors can really help to grow financial planning businesses, which you've had a lot of experience of working with financial planning businesses in your previous role at um, Snappy Kraken, obviously. But before we get into all of that kind of stuff, can you just tell us what it, what we mean when we say brand ambassador and what, what does that actually, just to start things off and give a bit of context, what do we mean when we say ambassadors for brands? Yeah. So ambassadors are representatives of your brand. They are promoters of your brand and they're, they exist to help spread the word around your brand. And when they do that, they go out in the space and they create connections with people, positive connections, great experiences. And as a representative of your brand, now that is, that is how people are now experiencing your brand. And so they're an extension of your brand. They're creating those connections. They're vocalizing your value for you. And they're doing that in a method of different channels, right? If you think of content creators, for example, content creators, if they're creating content on behalf of a brand, they are a brand ambassador. And Mm -hmm. so they might be doing that through social media, or they might be doing that in person, you know, out in the field at events. Or in my case, I do a lot of webinars. And so that's really my platform. So I think every ambassador has their own unique platform, their, their, their talents, their own special sauce. And then they're going to take that and deploy that in a way that represents your brand uh, in a positive light. Yeah. And I think, so I think one of the questions is, is, is really about like, obviously we can identify you as the brand ambassador for those companies that you work with, Mm -hmm. but it's weird that, well, it's not weird, sorry. It's, it's just interesting that brand ambassadors can come from anywhere. And, you know, as if we're thinking about financial planning businesses, a lot of their brand ambassadors are probably going to be their clients and the people that they work with and their extensions of the brand as well. And it might be kind of unusual to think of them that way, but ultimately they are. Yeah. Um, and I think I saw, well, I, I mentioned a stat this morning on one of the other sessions that we were doing. I think this th- one of the statistics I've seen is that 85-ish, I think it was, percent of consumers say that they trust their peers mm-hmm. more than any other form of marketing, uh, yeah. advertising, whatever it might be which just shows that this this thing deserves more than just simply just us talking about it all the time. It deserves yeah. a lot of attention because that's huge. When you think about it, that is almost a, a, a it's, it's almost all the time it's going to work rather than other things that you're doing out there. So I don't think we need to look at this as if it's just something, it is an enormous thing for your business. I completely agree. And just to add to that, when you think about like online reviews, for example, those are your peers telling the stories on behalf of the companies, but we want to focus there because like you said, we're focusing on what our peers want and what our peers have to say. And, you know, I, I, in the U S at least there's been a lot of change in regulation around testimonials that planners can collect from their clients and promote. And we're already seeing for the ones that are actually doing it right now, they're the ones getting that call, right? Compared to the planner down the street who doesn't have a single review, that planner is getting that call. And that just speaks to exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And it's because, you know, our profession is, again, I was, there's been a lot of similarity in the sessions that we've been doing today. And people who have been on every session today will be bored of me talking about this, but the idea that you know, we're, we're such a human profession, but also we are such a, a trust-based profession uh, yeah. in that, mm-hmm. you know, in reality, these people are giving you enormous amounts of not only sometimes money, but also their whole livelihoods and mm-hmm. their trust in terms of they'll tell you things that they'll never tell anybody else. They'll tell you things mm-hmm. that they haven't even talked about to their spouses and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And that's why they trust their peers because it, but I mean, it, it comes across to pretty much all services, doesn't it? Is that I'm always going to trust mm-hmm. what somebody, one of my mm-hmm. friends says or whatever, because I trust them mm-hmm. over what the company says about themselves. I mean, that's just exactly. common sense, isn't it? It's just because you're always, the company is always going to big themselves up better than what everybody yeah. else will, will say about <laughs> them, basically. So it's good. It's a useful summary. Sorry, my dog just barked. So I don't know if anybody <laughs> heard. That. It's the first time she's barked all day today as well, which is amazing. Um, she saved it for the last session. <laughs> she did. And now she's going to start being a little monkey. I know she is. So if we could think back to the years before you started going down this route of brand evangelism obviously you you were working with a lot of financial planning businesses and mm-hmm. specifically on their marketing as well mm-hmm. you mentioned about the the 
the reviews being kind of something that is making businesses successful nowadays. But what are the other things, like what some of the traits that some of those businesses that you've worked with over the years, over those years, what are some of the, the really good traits that they've had in their marketing that you think has, has made them successful over those years? Yeah. So I think when it comes to financial marketing, you've got experts, financial planners that really understand the vernacular, the jargon of the industry. And that stuff gets very complex. And then mm -hmm. you have everyone else who, you know, we're, we just need help with our money, but we don't necessarily connect to or understand some of that jargon. So when I've worked with financial advisors and planners over the years, what's become really clear is the planners who are doing it right, they're, they're taking that financial jargon and they're simplifying it to the most basic fundamental levels. And they're taking that and they're creating content with it, like newsletters, and they're they're being very specific with who they're targeting. For example, a, a successful planner that I follow online, he specifically works with consultants. And so every single piece of content he puts out is basic in understanding. There, it's free of that financial jargon, and it specifically targets consultants. And it helps them with their pain and their challenges, but also it understands their needs and their wants and their desires, their aspirations. So I think it really comes down to being as, as simple as you possibly can. People are going to tune out what they can't understand. And as you're very well aware, Dan, we live in a world where we're constantly inundated with information. It's like digital pollution is what <laughs> I like to call it. And so we're just trying to sort of swim through and figure out what can my brain actually understand. And a lot of great marketing is actually based on great neuroscience, right? Like if the brain can only take on so much at one time, you better make sure that your content is simple enough so that I can absorb it really quick. Otherwise, it's just going to be pushed to the side and I'm going to I'm going to keep moving in that digital space and looking for other information. So truly the best planners are simplifying their content and they're targeting a very specific niche. Even if you know you can work with anyone with money or anyone over the age of 50, learn more about them and incorporate that into your marketing and into your messaging. Yeah, you've, you've just summarized everything that I've ever said on marketing, to be honest, in, in that answer. <laughs> that, is, that is exactly what I talk to people about all the time, is yeah. unless you've got a really clear target audience of who you want to work with, you've got no chance unless you target those people with a really clear, emotional, nice message about transformation again you've got no nowhere to start with marketing so if you get those two things right you want a really really good journey to get everything else right all the tools and all that stuff out there but but what you need first you need to understand who you want to work with and what the message that you're going to tell them is as well so you just summarized it perfectly sorry the reason i'm looking outside by the way is because it's literally looking like armageddon outside it's the heaviest oh, no. rain shower i've ever seen which is oh my gosh and i think it's thunderstorms as well so been all sorts of things on the podcast today um, so, but there is so something that we haven't really explored and I don't think I've ever talked about this actually and I thought I'd talk about it with you today it is one of those tools and one of the tools that certainly other I wouldn't say professions but other industries use uh, for instance things like beauty and stuff like that is influencer marketing mm -hmm. and we haven't really tapped into this yet I mean I don't know what it's like in the states but in the UK I mean you know I can't think of a financial planning business who's really kind of used influencer marketing and there's some rules about it and regulations and that kind of stuff and you've got to be careful sure. and things like that but sure. like i can do you th i mean first of all do you think that financial planning business businesses could use influencer marketing maybe it's probably useful actually that we define it first so if you could do that as well that would be great but also like what, what how do you think they can use that as a tool if they want to yeah. So let's start with the defining of influencer marketing. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, we talked about evangelists earlier and ambassadors and, and that's very much my positioning for my business. And there's a, there's a line you can draw to influencer marketing. There's definitely overlap, but I think the difference between the two is, is like an, an evangelist is not necessarily focused on selling their network to you. It's more so selling their knowledge of your network and who you're trying to target. Whereas when you look at influencers, they have huge networks most of the time. And so that's really what they're selling is they may not necessarily know 
you know, all about financial planners and what struggles that they go through and the whole technology map, like an evangelist might, but they will absolutely have a big enough network and the talent to be able to say, I can communicate your value and I can do that in front of my network. And so what you're getting in exchange is a ton of exposure. Now for financial planners specifically, I think most people, when they hear influencers, they might think of celebrities or like those sort of macro influencers. And those definitely exist. And if you've got connections and if the regulations allow for it, by all means, you know, leverage that, right? Get them on your commercials, get them hosting events with your clients. But I think for for most, what's probably more attainable is those micro influencers. And so thinking about a macro versus micro, right? A micro influencer may not have a huge following, but they might have the right following. So they might be connected with your target audience. For example, if you have, you know, you live in a community where you've got, you know, the top restaurants in the community and you know, ultra high net worth people love these restaurants and there's a restaurateur who, you know, is responsible for these restaurants and the amazing experience and the food. And he's almost like a little local celebrity, he or she really. Hmm. I would do everything in my power to get in contact with that local celebrity, that micro influencer and have them host a, a tasting or an event of some sort around, you know, the food and culinary experience. And that's just an example there of how you can kind of leverage more micro influencers. Now it doesn't even have to be local to your community, but if you know your, you know, your clients, they love uh, biking or cars, for example, and you, you they're, they're definitely following some of the more famous, you know, sports people in that arena. I'm giving crazy examples right now, but just the <laughs> point there is, is connect with those people. Of course, you're gonna have to pay them, but involve them in some way. Again, whether it's events, commercials, uh, or any, any sort of way they can engage with your audience. That's a great way for planners to just create that crazy emotional experience, right? People love influencers and especially if they've been following them for some time, imagine how that's going to make them feel. Yeah. It's really good actually to, to see it as a possibility in, in financial planning businesses, but also if we think even, I mean, you mentioned micro influencers there, which I love that term. Yeah. Your, your clients are probably, I'm going to say your, by the way, I'm talking to the audience here. Okay. Is that you clients, you'll probably have influences in your, in your client community, realistically. Um, you know, you'll have people who just generally like to influence other people. You'll have people who yeah. are those natural networkers who love to talk to anyone about anything and they'll love to talk to their friends and their family members about you. And this is one of the things I often recommend to people who are looking to get more referrals from their existing clients mm -hmm. is to identify who those kind of natural networkers or natural influencers are and offer them the best service in the world, treat them like your friends, treat them more better than, you, than you've ever treated anyone before. And that yep. is a kind of influencer marketing there when you think about it, because they are naturally going to tell other people about you like you said before, their their tag or their their audience is probably the same as yours as well, um, mm -hmm. and it's probably what you're looking for. So, yeah, we've never really explored that topic, but I'm glad that we've actually had a chat about that because yeah. it can actually be something that we could use. And yeah. something else that we mentioned earlier was the idea of you know this emotional part of marketing is is huge, and I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, but We've talked about this before as well today about the, the power of emotions because emotions drive decisions. But again, from those businesses that you've worked with over the years and, and even in the stuff that you do today, how do you think that the, the financial planning businesses can actually build on that like, or use those emotions in their marketing? Like, What are some of the things that you've seen people do really well over the years in mm -hmm. using emotional language and emotions, connections, that kind of thing in their marketing? Yeah, there's so many different avenues and, and answers to this question, but I'll mm. I'll try to keep it all organized. So something I talk about often is how financial planners can be more emotionally available. Mm. Now that might sound like, you know, some girlfriend that's talking to her boyfriend and telling her, <laughs> you need to be more emotionally available. It's <laughs> it's actually very similar. But when you think about it from a planner's perspective and, and just the the nature of business, right? Businesses and corporations 
that's, you know, they're very, they can be cold, they can be stuffy, right? And so how can we open that up a bit and and show that we care and, you know, show that more emotional side? Well, you've got to be emotionally available. And so when you think about that in the context of marketing and, you know, being emotionally available, there's so many different mediums that I think do a wonderful job at helping advisors with this. The first I'm going to talk about is podcasting. Now, I know podcasting is not very easy, right? It takes time. It it really does take time and effort. But when you think about the nature of a podcast, I have your voice as a planner in my ear while I am cooking, while I am driving, while I'm walking my dog or going to pick up the kids. Those are all very personal and emotional experiences. And, and when is the last time a, a client or a prospect has invited you into their home to speak in their ear as they do all these things? It just doesn't really happen. So when you think about that, it, it is such a great way to build a relationship with them and do it at scale. You're not actually having one-on-one conversations, but your podcast is going far and wide and people are listening to it during these emotional experiences. So when they yeah. finally meet you, it's like, wow, I feel like I already know you. I, I love you. You know, you're so great. And I've heard a lot of planners tell me this, like this has been the biggest differentiator for me in creating emotional connection. You know, I've had prospects come into my office and tell me they want to go with me because they love my podcast versus the planner down the street who doesn't have a podcast. So I think podcasting is an awesome medium. I also think that video is a great way for planners to be more personal. And why? Because most planners get really scared about doing video, but actually that's a good thing, Dan, right? If you're so perfect on video, I don't know if it's going to come across as genuine or personal versus the majority of planners They might have a little fear. They might trip up a little bit in their words, but guess what? That's coming across a lot more genuine, especially if it's on your phone or if it's from your home, or maybe you're on a family vacation making a quick video about something that happened in the markets. Whatever it might be, video and podcasting are awesome mediums to just be more emotionally available. I'm so glad you said that because I've literally been banging on about those all day, to be honest. So <laughs> that's good. I think the the podcasting one, especially. So yeah. uh, we, I, I was talking earlier today in one of the sessions about um, one of uh, one of my my friends who's launched a podcast in in the retirement sp- space, and he's doing fantastically well. Um, yeah. I think he's on episode like twelve or something now, which is amazing because he's got over that kind of three episode hurdle. Yeah. Um, and you know, even if even if no kind of he doesn't get the, a, a massive amount of clients from this. Those people that he talks to on a daily basis or whatever it is, they're going to, he's going to have an influence on them definitely. Um, yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, he just loves talking about it. So that's, yeah. that's oh, another thing about it is you should enjoy doing this stuff as well. So yeah, that's good. Um, something else I wanted to get your opinion on. And I spoke about this a little bit with um, our previous guest, Olivia Looper, who um, yeah. is an expert in this kind of the brand space as well. Yeah, is the idea of what a brand actually means and also the difference between personal brand and business brand and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think hopefully, well, you would definitely agree with this, but building a brand is not just having a pretty logo and yeah. having a nice font. Uh, they are important, don't get me wrong. Like yeah. they definitely are important, but it goes way, 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 way beyond that. And it's all about messaging and that kind of stuff. So when you're when you're talking to financial planners and when you're speaking with people about this kind of stuff, what kind of things are you talking to them about on how they can grow their, their well, we'll start with personal brand first, because I'm, again, I mentioned this today, but I think I'm probably on the side of personal brand at the moment rather than business yeah. brand. So yeah. what are the kind of things that you talk to people about when you're talking about growing their brand and, and their personal brand? Yeah, I'm totally on the same side because I think yeah. what's happening is, company brands are becoming personal brands. And if you don't have personal brands in your company that are out there in the space, talking, getting personal online, your company could really fall behind. So in my opinion, they're becoming one and of the same. And if you don't have the personal side, then the business side is really going to suffer. Mm -hmm. There's one thing, in my opinion, that building a great brand comes down to. And you're right. It's not just your logo. It's definitely not just your colors. Like that's all important because it's the aesthetic and people connect with that, but it's certainly not the end all be all. And I think that one thing is consistency. So when you think about what actually makes a great brand, for example, like when you love going to your favorite restaurant 
or your favorite businesses, you know, ladies, your favorite hairstylists or nails or whatever it might be. It's because you're almost every time that you go going to have a great experience. You know, you can rely on that any time that you engage with that business. And so for financial planners, it's really about doing just that. It's about making sure every experience is consistently great for your clients and your prospects. Now, marketing, you know, creating experiences in your marketing, I think, um, you know, some people might draw the line at, well, we have to have video and we got to have newsletter and this and that and the other. And yes, those are important ways to market and build that brand. But also beyond that, just when someone calls your office, when someone walks into your office, right? What does it smell like? How's your attitude? Are they being greeted? Is Are you serving up their coffee or tea like they like it, right? Those are all experiences that you're creating that are building that brand. Now, thinking about personal brands specifically, as a planner in the firm, you should absolutely be going online and sharing your story. So, I also talk how important it is to not just only talk about yourself. So when I say this, please don't make it a hundred percent of your <laughs> personal brand marketing, because yeah. then it just becomes like, okay, that person's only thinking about themselves, yeah. but, but more so, um, you know, what is, what are your interests and hobbies? Share that picture of your family. Talk about how you got to where you are. Most of us are not born with silver spoons in our mouths. So how did you get to where you are? How did you accumulate the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge and change people's lives and your own life with that knowledge? So I'm always a big fan of saying, tell your story, use the right mediums to make it emotionally available and connecting and make sure that not all of your content is just finance, but also personal, your friends, your family, your come up be able to really articulate that. And that is how over time you will create that personal brand. And that's an extension of your corporate brand. Yeah. And it's interesting because that's the second time in the last two hours that somebody has said that personal brand or was it, was it company brands are becoming personal brands or the other yeah. way around. And yeah. that is, it's, it's interesting. So interesting that you, right. you both yeah. said that in the last couple of hours, which is really interesting. Yep. But on, on that on that on the business brand maybe just spend a couple of maybe just spend a minute or so on that like for those business owners and for the yeah personal brands great but let's just think about the business brand for a second what are some of the things that we need to start thinking about on that business brand side as well Mm -hmm. yeah so with the business brand i think you know there's always a level of sophistication that should be needed but again whatever content that you're putting out whatever experiences that you're putting out everyone in your business should be in lockstep, right? It, there shouldn't be a huge campaign put out and then a prospect calls in and your client service person doesn't really understand or they're confused, right? That that's kind of creating that 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 stopping point for people to say, well, they don't I don't know if they really have their stuff together. Right? So I think the business brand piece is making sure everyone is in lockstep around every campaign, around every event that you're launching. And on that note, I think events are powerful for business brand building you know, we can post all the content on social media that we want, and that will take us far with our companies. But what if we're actually getting people together, right? In community, you really just cannot beat that. Of course, virtual events are another great way that planners can do that, but you can't beat having the in-person events. And if you want to have a more you know, a great brand, you really, what you're saying is you want to build a referable practice. You want people who are saying, I really love what they do and you need to talk to them. You know, they're, they're going out there and advocating for you. That's building a referable practice and doing that through your, your company brand should be focused on building that community. And you can do that in person. You can do that online. I would encourage planners to do both. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I, again, I'm so, I'm so sorry to say this, but that's literally tied in with everything that I've been talking about today. So, oh God, it's perfect this because it's drawing it all so nicely together. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love the idea of uh, client events. I think one thing with client events is to stay away from doing things that, that you find interesting and right. focus on things that your clients are going to find interesting. So nobody wants to go them. to, yeah, yeah, literally you can ask them yeah. what they're going to find interesting. So um, retirement, uh, a, a, a pension investing webinar sorry uh, ev- event uh, even saying that out loud makes me want to you know jump out that window <laughs> but 
And if you could turn that into one of some, so I'm going to give a, a name check here to some amazing people in our community. People might know them as the Ellis sisters. So it's Jennifer Ellis and, Nic and Nicola Ellis from uh, a firm in Glasgow called Wellington Wealth. And they do something, I don't know if they do it every year or whether they've just done it a few times, but they do something called an antiques roadshow with their clients where they'll get their clients to come along, yeah, that cool. client community, which is so strong in their business. And they'll invite a valuer to come along and all their clients bring along a piece of, whether it's jewelry or, you know, those kind of heirlooms that just get passed down the generations and mm -hmm. just bring them along and get them valued and see what they're like and see if they're, they're valuable. But they also bring, I think they said they bring a friend or bring a family member or something like that. So you're building that community, but you're also making it bigger as well. Things like that. I mean, it doesn't have to be boring or dull. It can be interesting, fun, cool things like that. And obviously, these they, they won't just come and get their stuff valued and leave. They stay, they have drinks, they enjoy themselves, they have some food, all that kind of stuff. All these things are great for building that, that community. So get creative yeah. with those events as well. But I'm yeah. definitely on the side of you of the, the uh, events are still a thing, very much so. Um, especially I as well. I, I know that like, we get bored talking about a certain pandemic that happened three years ago but i think even so after that now i enjoy events even more, even more. Mm -hmm. because i know what the taste of not having them was like and it wasn't a very nice taste so having them yeah. now sorry my alarm's going off my okay. having that taste now even tastes even better because it's just like oh god i really didn't realize how much i actually missed this a few years ago Absolutely. There's no better time to to just leverage that. I think a lot of people are feeling that way. So it's a really timely thing to do in your marketing. Uh, real quick, just what you said about creativity, that is such a game changer. That is another area that I didn't touch on, but for distinguishing your corporate brand, design, great mm -hmm. design. And, and I know we said your brand is not just your logo, but when you're thinking about corporate side of it, how many corporate brands out there are just so boring and they use the same colors and the same logo and the, the mountaintops and the compass and, you know, this, all the blue and green, like imagine completely flipping that on its head and how many more eyeballs you're going to get to your brand simply because you have focused mm -hmm. on design. I think you know all about this, Dan, you're an amazing designer. I love all of your content, but you see that it captures my attention, even with your business brand, because it is so well designed, more planners could use creative seats at the table for sure. Yeah. Yeah. They definitely could. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, I've got a big question for you now. Okay. <laughs> so after or working with all those people for all for these businesses for all these years and for the financial planners themselves, but also the financial planning businesses as well. And I, I'm a big lover of the, of the number three. So we're going to keep it to yeah. three. If you could give three, I was going to say tips, but let's just say three wishes that you would mm -hmm. wish that financial planners would do in their marketing uh, going forward, what would those three things be? Okay. So my first wish is something I alluded to earlier, and it might sound really basic, but it is that important. And it is starting at the, at the whiteboard and creating your customer avatar. Mm -hmm. Now, this might mean you have two or three customer avatars, depending on who you serve, but your customer avatar, I'm talking about doing a full mapping of every single thing that your customers love or your ideal customers love, of what they don't love, of what gives them pain in their lives, of what they want, aspire, and desire in their lives have a full blown whiteboard session and make sure all of that is documented. And the reason that I'm saying this is because there's just too many planners that rush to say, I can serve anyone and my marketing is just going to be very general. And that's just not cutting it anymore. That's the problem, right? There's more and more planners entering the space. There's more people that need financial education. So start there, everything else that you do, right? Don't rush to social media. Don't rush to create that blog post until you do this. So that's my wish number one, because it is so, wish. so important. I agree. Okay. Wish number two is also some of what I said earlier, but go to your website, and I want you to read the first few, in the first five seconds of your website, I want you to ask, do people understand how I can help them? Not necessarily do people understand what I do, 
but do people understand how I can help them specifically? So it's like a five second rule, check your website. I also want you to find up every single sentence that says, we do this and we do that and we're appreciating to how that actually benefits them. So tip number three is all about creating that experience. So maybe if you're feeling overwhelmed about all the different social channels, think about what you can do in-house. Think about when every prospect walks into that office, what is their experience like? Are they being greeted? Are they being given something to snack on or something to drink on? Do you have you know, content or magazines there they can consume that they're actually interested in, right? So creating that experience for them. Also, when they call into your office, again, how are they being greeted? How are, you know, what is that experience like? So I want you to think a little bit less about we've got to be creating all this content all of the time, which yes, that's important, but more so about with our current clients, what is the experience that they're getting and how can we improve that? So it's almost a, a play on experience marketing. And again, that's how you build a referral practice. And for most planners, that's their biggest source of growth is through referrals. Amazing. If I could wish for those three things as well, then we've got double trouble <laughs> So because I desperately want all of those things. I think yep. the first one though, of getting really clear on their target audience, that is the ultimate one. If we take it back to first principles of marketing, something that, you know, the people like um, Simon Sinek and all those kind of people start with is literally, unless you know that, you've got no chance of doing everything else. And I, I actually, nowadays, I won't work with any anyone who isn't open to the idea of, having a really clear target audience or going niche or anything like that because yep. otherwise you you you're guaranteed to run into problems unless you really understand who it is that you want to work with because you just can't do marketing unless you know who you want to work with you just can't do it so totally and and not even just who you want to work with but what problems that they're having yeah. right and because everything has to solve their problem that's how you that's how you sell that's how you get people in the door is like it's not hey here's what we do it's hey we're going to solve x problem for you that we know has been on your mind for a really long time yeah definitely if we could just flip it for a second just before because we've got about 10 minutes left ish okay. something like that um you are uh, obviously you're in the wealth tech space it's it's an interesting term that i don't know whether it's yeah. two words or, or whether wealth tech is two words or one word or whether, I, I don't know, I don't know, whatever it is anyway. <laughs> but it's a very, very exciting space. Yeah. I love how kids, um, some of the kids' stuff, they always post like the big map of all of the available tools yeah. across there in the US. I'm like, wow, yeah. I can't believe it. I mean, the UK is is like, we've got a lot of tech across here, but it's nowhere near the amount of stuff that you guys have. So it's an wow. exciting space, lots of stuff going on. But what are you, what, what are you really seeing that you're excited about? At the moment obviously you have to talk about your i would imagine you have to talk about your brands that you're an evangelist for but what what is what, what are you getting really excited about in the wealth tech space at the moment yeah there's a lot to be excited about in the wealth tech space and actually i just gave a presentation this week we had over 400 financial planners register and it was all about the estate planning technology category it is growing quickly. I mean, we've seen just in the last three years, more estate planning technologies pop up. And what's unique about that is most advisors and planners, that's either they're not touching that area because they're they're not attorneys and they just sort of refer out or they're afraid of you know unauthorized practice of law. But what's happening now is technology is is completely changing that, right? It's yeah. it's actually bringing the client in and getting them hands on to creating their estate plan and they have to do that because advisors can't tell them, "Hey, you need this specific type of trust or will," but rather hi, I have this great technology. It's going to guide you through to tell you what you need. And I'm going to be there to help you along the process and how that plays into your bigger financial plan and picture. So estate planning technology is growing really quickly. The financial backing there is huge. Um, aside from that, advice engagement is another category that's mm -hmm. growing quickly. And that's that's really all about how are you engaging with your clients through the advice that you're giving them? So, <coughs> excuse me. So 60% of people are visual learners, right? And I think when traditionally planners work with clients and they deliver that financial plan, it's like this 
40 page document and it's all text. And that just, you know, for some people, it's like, I can't understand this. I can't connect to this. This isn't my plan. This is your plan. And so they start not following it. Right. And so with advice engagement, we're seeing really cool tools like Asset Map and Bento Engine and VisaWealth for every question out there a client might have on their financial situation. There's a map. And it's beautiful. And it just, it, again, it helps people consume the information in the way they need to so they can actually connect with it. Um, for me personally, yes, I am working with some of the best tools in the space. So I work with Wealthbox. They're a CRM for financial planners and they're built specifically for financial planners. So every field and every you know touch point and feature is specific to the industry. And planners really, really like that. It makes it easy for them to manage their relationships. And I I actually had another webinar this week where I talked about your data is so important and and that's where it's supposed to be housed is the CRM. So if you don't have clean data or personalized data on your clients, how can you deliver that personal experience, that emotional experience for them? Um, And then of course, testimonial marketing. So we touched on it earlier earlier. It's, it's new, it's up and coming. The SEC in the US just two years ago started allowing planners to promote testimonials that they've gotten from clients. Mm-hmm. And so I work with a company called Wealth Tender, which is the first SEC compliant testimonial marketing platform for advisors. So you build a profile, we boost it up with SEO, your clients leave reviews, we make them compliant with all these disclosures. And then now that's showing up on the top of Google, people can understand and read your story, right? Letting other people tell your story. And that's working really, really well. So all in all, estate planning, advice engagement, CRM, testimonial marketing, there's a lot going on. There is a lot to be excited about, especially (laughs) on the, I mean, personally, just this is where kind of I am getting really excited is especially that advice, advice engagement piece of uh, it's the whole like ikea effect of i'm taking part in building i'm the architect of my own financial plan that is next level advice that's so different to what we've been used to in the past uh, yep. because that is putting the client to the center of their financial plan and it's their plan now it's not your plan it's mm-hmm. it's the financial plan so really exciting i'm excited for you uh, diana that sounds absolutely incredible um so next question, just to finish off, is the last next couple of questions. I love asking the next one because it's so optimistic. If you think 10 years in the future, and if you look at financial planning and say, oh, that's changed over the last 10 years, what are you most excited to see over the course of the next 10 years that we we'll think will really drive our profession forward? Yeah, there's a few different things here that I'm I'm excited about saying. First and foremost, as a woman, I'm very excited to see more women in the industry, entering the the space, becoming financially empowered, and then turning around and helping other women become financially empowered. I think that is beautiful to see. And, and, you know, in the next 10 years, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I'm also obviously excited about the innovation with technology. I, I think there's so many things that we haven't even thought about yet in ways we can transform the way planners work with clients and not just work with them, but find clients and connect with them through, you know, different technologies is, is yeah. As I answered in the last question, there's a lot going on there. So imagine 10 years from now, I think all of our minds will be pretty blown. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is, Again, there's so much information going out online. I think every one of us, we're like collectively, our consciousness, right, is collectively evolving together. And that might sound really woo, but it's true. We're all learning all these digital channels and we're all getting better at it. And that means we're all finding more financial information, bless you, than ever before. Do you say that in the UK, by the way? (laughs) Okay, than ever before. And that excites me because it means the masses are having more and more opportunity than ever before to get financial education. I think that's why it is so important for planners to create content. You know, in the U.S., at least there's like this big argument between financial planners and content creators that are focused on personal finance. But the reality is, you know, they're they're angry because the personal content creators are just doing a really good job at building these huge followings and giving advice. Now they need to do the same thing to make sure the advice is fully accurate. 
but it excites me in general, Dan. We're all elevating in our financial knowledge and that's just going to make a better future for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Some some very, very cool things in there. I, that's why I love asking that question because nobody's <laughs> ever given a bad answer to that one. Uh, I think all of those things though, they're, they're not like things that we, uh, you know, are hopelessly getting excited for. I think there's big moves in all of those different areas. Uh, oh. And I'm like genuinely very excited to see what it looks like in 10 years time once all of those things that we've talked that you talked about there have come to fruition because it's going to be amazing to see really is yeah. i'm glad that we actually get we're around to we're going to be well hopefully we're going to be around to see it which would be amazing um yeah. final thing that we always like to ask everybody um and there's been some absolute corkers recommended today is for a book that has helped them in their career so far. So if you could recommend something to our audience for them to give a read over the weekend, maybe, because it's Friday today. I don't know if anybody knows that. What would you uh, recommend our audience consume? Okay, so I'm really passionate about public speaking. Um, I, it's just for me, I've loved it since I was a kid. I know that's not everyone's situation, but I think in general, it is so important that you know how to communicate well. You can be the smartest planner in the world, but if you can't communicate well and you can't capture attention, you're not going to be able to impact as many people as you're destined to. So with that, my favorite book that's helped me a lot with communication and speaking is called Talk Like Ted. So it's based on the TED Talks around the world. And the person that wrote it was Carmen Gallo, G-A-L-L-O. But that book has just, it helps me so much to deliver engaging, but also inspiring presentations. And, and even just in meetings, communicate in a way that has, you know, drives authority and gets people to really listen and engage with you. And again, there is nothing more important than communication. Yeah, completely agree. That is actually a really nice way to to sum up this whole conference because obviously today is part of the overall Next Gen Planners Supernova 23 conference, which yeah. comes to a close today. And as part of that, we had 70 people who've never spoken in front of an audience before or have done, but never in front of a big audience before, you know, learn how to give 10 minute TED style talks in front of, the, of our audience. Every single one of them smashed it. Wow. Every single one of them did it. Every single one of them came through and delivered their message wow. beautifully. And it's great to see every every single year. So that is actually a really nice way. And you didn't even know you were going to be doing this, but it's such a lovely way to, to finish this whole thing as well. So thank you so much for that, Donna. I'll definitely, well, I was going to say I'll definitely give that the read. That's a lie because I'm not a reader, uh, but I'll try and find out a way. You find the audio version. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get the Blinkist or something like that. I'm sure one of them exists out there. But um, that is all we have time for today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, what we like to do is we like to give the last word to our guest to say a big thank you for coming on the show. So can you tell our audience uh, how to find you, where to connect with you, and if you want to leave us with any last words as well, please feel free for you to do so. Absolutely. I love having conversations on social media. So in, connect with me on LinkedIn and on Twitter, Diana Cabri says, my last name is weird. Just think cab, like taxi cab, rice, like what you eat. And then an S at the end, uh, which has no connection whatsoever. But Diana Cabri says is my handle. Find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter. Of course, you can check out my website, www.dianacabrisas.com. But you'll definitely find me on social talking about a lot of what I talked about today and I'd love to engage with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Diana. That was uh, Diana Cabri says on the Next Gen Planners podcast as part of your CPD light year in a day. And for anybody who's watching this live, that is it. So it's finished now. The whole conference is done. Your CPD light year in a day is done. Thank you so much to everybody who turned up today. Thank you so much to everybody who came along to the conference. Thank you to all of our amazing speakers, our wonderful hosts, our sponsors, everything who got involved this year. It's been wonderful uh, to have this kind of community feeling amongst us and we'll be doing it again uh, next year um, if you're listening to this in the future and you want to find out more about next gen planners then just go to nextgenplanners.co.uk on there you'll find out more information about our amazing community uh, which is now over 1100 finance professionals here in the uk and growing every single week and we are guarantee that you will uh, find out uh, more information about us on our website uh, and also if you could leave us a review it really helps us to grow uh, the podcast as well so please let us know what you think of the podcast but for now that is all we have time for so thank you so much to diana again for coming on today thank you guys for listening as always and we will see you in the next one bye bye